Let me say, first of all, the great privilege and delight it is for me to be with you this evening. Thank you for your kind invitation. Uh, it is, uh, as I've said, a privilege uh, to be here. Uh, we have known of each other uh, since 2006, as was said to you uh, in that brief introduction, uh, when I came up from Southern California to take up the call at Grace Reformed Baptist Church. And I know the congregation has been uh, associated in fellowship with you here before that even. And so we are uh, thankful uh, for our fellowship together in the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ. And so let me bring the greetings of the saints in Placerville to you this evening. And it is uh, a great joy to us to have your pastor, one of your pastors, uh, Brother Steve, uh, uh, Pastor Steve Meister uh, preaching in our pulpits uh, this evening, and so we pray that the Lord would uh, bless him as he declares the unsearchable riches of Christ even to the brethren there. Please open your Bibles and turn to Luke's Gospel and chapter 9. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. This evening we're going to read from verse 28 through verse 50. As you will see from uh, your bulletins, the sermon will focus on the text from verse 37 through verse 50, but for the sake of context and connection, we're going to read from verse 28. So Luke 9 at verse 28, please give your careful attention as we hear God's Word. Now about eight days after these sayings, he, that is Jesus, took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. 
the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them, so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. Amen. And thus far, the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Well, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this, your word. We pray that you would bless it to us. We ask that you would send your spirit, that he might help us, that we might hear and heed all that you would say. The blessing we pray for ourselves, O Lord. We pray also for the saints in Placerville and pray that, pray that you would enable your servant, Pastor Steve, as he declares your word there. Grant him all needed aid, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. One would hope that Christians of all people would be a good advertisement for Christianity. Sometimes, by God's grace, we are, but sadly, not always. Certainly, unbelievers are quick to notice our weaknesses and failings, what we might call the reality gap between what we often say with our lips and those things they see in the lives that we live before them. Now, criticizing Christians can easily become just another excuse for not coming to Christ. Some of those criticisms, criticisms may be inaccurate, and sometimes they may be unfair and unjust. But sometimes, people's perceptions of Christians and of the church are far more accurate than we would like to admit. Rather than helping people to come to Christ and brothers and sisters to grow in grace and knowledge of the truth, we do indeed sometimes get in the way of those things by the weaknesses and the failings and the sins in our lives. Here, as we come to our passage this evening in Luke's Gospel, in Luke chapter 9, verses 37 through 50, we see four mistakes the disciples made that are often also made by every Christian, by Christians today. But Jesus has grace, and Jesus has mercy for His erring people. We're going to think about five things this evening. First of all, lacking trust. Secondly, easily distracted. Thirdly, elevating self. Fourthly, the wrong enemy. And lastly, and most gloriously, a long-suffering Savior. So first of all, then, lacking trust in verses 37 through 42. The first mistake that Christians often make is not trusting God to do that which only He can do. The disciples here made this mistake when they were confronted by the powers of darkness in a demon-possessed boy that we read in verses 37 through 39 and again at verse 42. 
The boy's father, desperate for help, had first gone to the disciples, but they could not cast out the unclean spirit, Luke tells us, verse 40. Now, why was that? The Lord previously had given them power to cast out evil spirits. Indeed, by God's enabling and grace, they had done so previously. So, why not on this occasion? They did not fail for want of trying, it would seem, but they failed due to their lack of faith. They lacked trust on this occasion for God to do what only God could do. This is clear from the way that Jesus answered the boy's father in verse 41. O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Now, certainly the word generation here in this verse implies that others were there that day, even in the crowd observing, who doubted His power to save. But the faithless people here in the immediate context were these disciples, those who did not have the faith to cast out the demon. Jesus then, having said that, himself cast out the unclean spirit. He performed this mighty, miraculous deliverance that His disciples could not, but they could have done had they believed and trusted in the Lord rather than themselves, verses 42 through 43. Brethren, sometimes we are just like those disciples. We can say with our lips that we believe in God and we trust in Him, but do we really trust Him when it comes down to it, to do only that which He can do, or do we so easily trust in ourselves? All too often, we try to serve Him in our own strength, do we not, as the disciples did here, and we fail just like they did. The application here for us this evening is not so much that we need to trust God to help us cast out demons, but the application here is that we need to trust God to do all the spiritual work that only He can do. What does that mean for us? Well, of course, we could spend the rest of our time this evening fleshing that out, and we could preach a whole sermon here, but let me just try and line that out in summary for you. We certainly need faith. We need to trust in God in our struggle against temptations. Is it not true if we are honest with ourselves, even if we are not honest with each other often about these things, that we're trying to come up with all kinds of methods and strategies to manage our sins, to contain them, to control them, whilst we know all the time that the only way to deal with them and to be delivered from temptation is through the real transforming power that comes from the gospel and the gospel alone. We need to trust in that good news gospel that changes hearts and minds and lives. We need faith. We need to trust in God to do only that which He can do, even in every attempt we have to serve the Lord as His faithful disciples, to serve Him both as individual Christians and as a local church, both here locally in the community where God has placed you, and even further afield to the ends of the earth as we seek in the one church of the Lord Jesus to labor together to advance the kingdom of His Son. And we need faith, we need to trust in God to do only that which He can do in our ongoing war with the evil one. We see here as He sought to destroy the life of this young boy, He seeks to destroy everything. That is His great mission, that is His great desire. He seeks to destroy everything that we would attempt to do for God if we are going to thwart Him, if we are going to be successful in the spiritual battle against Him, we need to trust in God to do only that which He can do, even as we seek to do it in His power and strength. 
Well, then that brings us in the second place to being easily distracted, verses 43 through 45. A second mistake that most Christians make is to take our eyes off the cross, to take our eyes off the cross. We are so easily distracted. And even when we think about spiritual things, we may be more interested in the power and the glory of them rather than in the sufferings and in the calling of the cross. Jesus knew that His disciples faced this kind of temptation. So, immediately after He had healed the boy from the unclean spirit, casting it out, He said this, even whilst the text tells us they were all marveling at everything that He was doing, Jesus said to His disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, verses 43 and 44. And so, the main message of the gospel is not that Jesus can perform wondrous miracles, true though that is. The main message of the gospel is to do with a suffering and dying Savior that Jesus came to live the perfect life that we could not, a life of righteousness that God demands, and that having done so, that He would give His life a ransom for many. He would die a sin-bearing death on the cross in the place of sinners. Let these words, Jesus says, sink into your ears. Don't be distracted from the centrality of the cross. And yet, too often, we do take our eyes off that cross, do we not? We are not satisfied with the centrality of Jesus, a crucified Savior. We want all sorts of other things that life has to offer, the glory and the satisfaction now. Often, we're not willing to suffer with our Lord. Suffer perhaps the embarrassment of talking about Jesus with friends who may scoff and may mock the crucified Savior. We might think it might harm our job prospects, our careers, by taking our stand for Jesus and all that He commands. Or we might think it's just too costly to give up some comfort in this life to give it up to serve the Lord, whether it be here or perhaps even to go further afield wherever the Lord would send us, even to some far-off place, even as we are thinking of the work in the Philippines or some other distant land. So often, we don't want to focus on the cross and the call of the cross to costly, sacrificial discipleship even for Jesus, we take our eyes off the cross. But Jesus here calls us to keep that cross at the very center of all that we do. The cross must remain at the center of our evangelism. It must remain at the center of our stewardship of all that God has given us, that we use it to the glory of God of all those small decisions as we may think that we make day by day, as we invest all that God has given to us in our abilities, our gifts, our talents, our time, in gospel work, in the advancement of the kingdom of Jesus. It must remain at the center of all that we do in our families, in our church life, as we seek to serve one another in love. We're not to become easily distracted, but to keep the cross at the center of all that we do. And then thirdly, that brings us to elevating self in verses 46 through 48. The third mistake here that we see that Christians make is to seek greatness for ourselves rather than for God. Verse 46, an argument arose among them as to which of them was 
the greatest. Now, previously, Jesus had been telling them to deny themselves, to take up His cross, and to follow Him. But rather than carrying their cross, they're still trying to climb the ladder to get to the top, aren't they? And get to the top before anyone else, and certainly perhaps even at the expense of someone else. Now, to show how childish this was, we read verse 47, Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Jesus said that the way His disciples treated little children would indicate what kind of relationship they truly had with Him and with His Father in heaven. And people have the humility to welcome children in this way. They are really welcoming the triune God, Jesus says. This is one of those upside-down principles that we often see in the Scriptures, one of those upside-down values of the kingdom of God in which the least are great. Notice significantly what Jesus says here. He doesn't say great trust. He says great. It's not just that one Christian gets to be the greatest in the kingdom, but even the most lowly saints, the most humble saints, who has understood what Jesus says here, is great in the kingdom. So, it's not about a fight in the kingdom to scramble over others like it is in the corporate world, or it might be in families, or it might be in communities. How do I get ahead, and how do I make sure that somebody doesn't get ahead of me? Jesus says those that are the least, not just one, but all those who truly follow Him are great. Of course, Christ Himself is our great example, is He not? Paul speaks, of course, in his letter to the Philippians of Christ, of one rather than holding on to the privileges of His own exalted position as Son of God, those things which were truly His by right, He humbled Himself, even to death on a cross, for sinners like us, brothers and sisters. Part of our Savior's true greatness is that He did not see greatness for Himself. And so, what a mistake it is for us, brethren, for us to play that kind of spiritual one-upmanship that the disciples played here. Who is the greatest among us? Certainly, it is the mantra of our world, isn't it, and of our culture. You can hear those words, can't you, famous of Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest. And the parading around that he did, and the dancing around, and great an athlete and a boxer though he was, world champion, all of that, it was such a presumptuous claim, wasn't it? I'm the greatest. We don't have to be world champion boxer we don't have to be world champion of anything to still have that spirit, though, where we think we are the greatest. And we constantly want to compare ourselves with other brethren and say, well, I am greater than them, aren't I? Think of the great presumption here that they were almost expecting the Lord to vindicate somebody's claim here. Christ is our great example that He did not look to those things which were His right. He is the greatest, King of kings and Lord of lords. And yet, we play that kind of one-upmanship, don't we? If not in our individual lives, we do in our churches. My church is greater than your church. My church is bigger and better than your church. My service is more important than yours. It's a great mistake. Jesus says, to elevate self, 
the way to become great in the kingdom is to become least. Jesus tells them, and He tells us. Well, that brings us in the fourth place to the wrong enemy, verses 49 through 50. As he heard what Jesus was saying about true spiritual greatness, John thought back to a recent encounter, it would seem, with someone else in the ministry, verse 49. It perhaps was all very well for Jesus to talk about being least in the kingdom of God, but surely some distinctions do have to be made. Were not the disciples at least, if not greater than one another, at least they were better than people who went around doing things in Jesus' name, but were not part of their fellowship, not one of us. Surely we are greater than those people, John thinks. Again here it is stunning how it appears he expects the Lord to agree with him. Jesus responds by saying, verse 50, do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. We don't know really anything else about this other man, but he was someone who was trying to serve the Lord Jesus, however imperfectly, and one, it would seem ironically, who was able by faith trusting in the Lord to cast out demons, doing that very thing that the disciples had so recently spectacularly failed to do. And yet John is saying, stop him. He's not one of us. Jesus here warned His disciples not to make the mistake of fighting the wrong enemy. Now, was Jesus taking an indifferent attitude here to discipleship then? and basically saying to every Christian, you are free to go and do and pursue whatever uh, ministry you please. Does this legitimize, as we would call them, lone ranger Christians to go and do their own thing and accountable to anyone? The answer to that is no. He is not saying that. How do we know that? Well, we go to the words of our Lord in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 19, for instance, where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so Christians are not free simply to do as they please. The church of the Lord Jesus is to teach each and every disciple all those things the Lord has commanded, and He expects that to be taught, and He expects the church to heed and to obey what is taught. So, I don't think we have to, to dwell on that. We could expand other places to say Jesus here is not endorsing a lone ranger mentality, but that's not His point here. What concerned the Lord here was a deep-seated attitude in His disciple John of, again, a them and us way of looking at the world, a them and us mentality, as we would call it, because it would seem here that John is anxious to safeguard his own role and his own prominence here, and he does not want anyone else who is not part of our group to be allowed to do these things. John's real concern here is not for Christ's honor and His kingdom. The real issue here, Jesus says then, is whether this man is one of your group is not the issue, John, but whether he is for you or against you in the work of the gospel, which means ultimately whether he is for me or against me. That's your issue that you should be concerned about, not to maintain your prominence and to seek to stop those that are not part of your group. Again, brethren, what does that teach us? I think, again, if we are honest with ourselves, brethren, we are all far too prone to think that no good can be done for our Lord's kingdom unless it is done by us. 
We can so easily be so narrow-minded, can't we, that we cannot conceive the possibility of doing it in any other way than our way. We make an idol of our own particular way of thinking about things. We make an idol of our own peculiar church and particular church. We can see often no merit in any other. Lord, stop them. They're not doing it right. We may think our fellow Christians mistaken in some points, and they may well be. We may be right about that. We may indeed be right that sometimes more could be done for Christ and His kingdom if there was greater cooperation, if others would join us, if all worked in the same way. But all of those things said must not prevent us, brethren, from rejoicing if the works of the devil are destroyed and souls are saved, and the Lord is pleased to do that through others as well as through us. That was the issue here. We might put it very simply, but very boldly this evening. Other Christians are not the enemy, brethren. That's what our Lord is telling John here. They are not the enemy. Satan, the devil, is the enemy, and we should be doing everything we can to encourage other Christians in their battle against him. We are in a holy alliance against the powers of darkness. And rather than having us attack one another, our supreme commander, the Lord Jesus Himself, orders us to fight the right enemy and not to identify and turn against the wrong enemy. Brethren, do we really take that seriously? The Lord Jesus gave a name to John and to his brother James. We might call it a pet name or a nickname. We may recall what that was, Sons of Thunder, Sons of Thunder. It was not really a compliment that he gave them, calling them that. Is that how you and I are sometimes known by other Christians? We are Sons of Thunder quick to draw the sword, quick to lay down the challenge, to throw down the gauntlet. Brethren, if even an apostle like John, a son of thunder, could be zealous for the wrong things and could identify the wrong enemy, one needing Christ's mercy and grace, then so do we too when we behave in that manner. We need Christ to intercede for us just as much as John did here. We need the one who was perfectly zealous for the right and proper object, zealous for the will of God, zealous not for his own well-being and reputation, but for the great task he had been given by his Father zeal for for fulfilling the law's righteous demands and exhausting the wrath of God for sinners. We need one who came and did that perfectly and completely so that sons of thunder, whether it be John or James or us this evening, could be made disciples sons and daughters of the great king, so that a son of thunder like John could be made the disciple whom Jesus loved. That brings us in the last place this evening to a long-suffering and patient Savior. Let me ask you, as I ask myself this evening, which mistakes are you making of these? If we're honest, sooner or later, we make them all. We do things in our own strength, not trusting in the power of God's grace. We often take our eyes off the cross, seeking satisfaction in earthly things, rather than giving our lives away in sacrificial service for Jesus. We elevate ourselves 
rather than putting God first and then others before ourselves. We wound our own brothers and sisters often with friendly fire of our critical spirits. The first disciples here made all these mistakes, which might make us wonder whether Jesus, as we might put it very reverently, made a mistake in choosing them. They weren't very great raw material, were they, when you look at how they really were. But here is the great comfort. Jesus has mercy and grace for people who make spiritual mistakes, for His erring people. Jesus had asked in verse 41, how long would He have to bear with the unbelief of His disciples? The answer is, as long as it took both to finish the work of their salvation and to teach them the right way to serve, as long as it would take to conform them to His own image and to bring many sons to glory. And brethren, Jesus has the same patience for us as His believing people here this evening. Even after we have made all of our mistakes, including these ones, mistakes that honor God, I should say dishonor God, mistakes that hinder people from coming to Christ, mistakes that discourage the brethren rather than stimulating them to love and good works, God is still working in us, brethren. He forgives our sins as we come in repentance and pleading His mercy, and He calls us again and again and restores us and says, follow me. Sometimes we are just like those disciples. We're not very good basic material either, are we, as we come as we are by nature. How long will Jesus bear with us? Will there come a day, brethren, when the Lord says, you know what, that's one time too many. I've borne with you again and again and again. Like, when will you ever get this? I'm done. I'm going to use somebody else. How long will He keep doing this? According to the gospel, for as long as it takes. That's not to make us presumptive. That's not for us to think, then I can simply do as I please, and the Lord will always forgive, and the Lord would always forbear. But it is a great comfort as the conviction of the Spirit comes upon our hearts of the mistakes that we do make and constantly make. But it assures us that as we come to Him in faith, as we plead His mercy, knowing what we are at best, erring disciples. He will not give us up. He will not leave us nor forsake us. He will keep His work ongoing as long as it takes until we are perfectly conformed to the image of the beloved Son, and we are perfected in glory, both body and soul, forever and ever. Let us give thanks for this long-suffering and for this patient Savior. Let's all pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank You for Your words. We thank You for the light that penetrates into the darkness. We thank You, O Lord, that that light exposes yet in those recesses of our hearts, those uh, areas of remaining sin, where, O oh Lord, we would want to appear so well, and yet so often we make these and so many other mistakes as these disciples did. We thank You for our Lord Jesus. We thank You for the words of truth that He speaks. We thank You for His long-suffering and patience with His erring children. Humble us again, we pray, and grant that we might repent, grant that we might turn to Christ and know His mercy and grace, and grant, O Lord, in His strength 
that we might seek to bring glory to Jesus Christ and that you might be pleased to use us to advance your kingdom. Be with your people here, and we pray that you would prosper their every endeavor to uh, uh, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ here in Midtown. Grant, O Lord, that the name of Christ may be uplifted, and grant, O Lord, that you would advance your kingdom here. We pray, O Lord, cause your saints here to grow in grace and knowledge of the truth, Conform them to the image of your Son, we pray. We ask it even as your Son asked that you might sanctify your saints, even in the truth. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.